pleasure to introduce Peter. Peter's not the type to really want much of an introduction, and indeed, in this audience, I would say he doesn't really need one. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I've prepared a lot. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know him like I do. Peter is the owner of the sphere of seven stars in the solar year, of Caesar's hand and Plato's brain, of Lord Christ's heart and Shakespeare's strength. <laughs>
the process of architectures, their interfaces between great blobs of software. So they're relatively stable things, and therefore maybe worth a little bit of effort, because if we can understand what those interfaces are, we have some hope of doing verification or testing or some other stuff um, for the large blobs of software in between them. <laughs> And what I really want to talk about is some themes that come up again and again when we do this kind of stuff. So dealing with very ill-defined and loose specifications and how we can test specifications against semantics. And I'll talk about various, some rather exotic, DSLs for specification that we use. And dealing with scale for all of these is a big thing. And dealing with the things like man calculus is no longer very challenging, but Scale up and it gets tricky. And then I'll talk about the interaction or otherwise that we've had with the systems communities in some of these places. Um, so that's what I really want to talk about, but in order to get any of that across, I have to explain something of all of these things in the next not very many minutes. So I hope you didn't drink too much at the banquet, or if you did, it was in a you know, motivating kind of way. <laughs> Uh, TCP. You know what TCP is? And the internet. Uh, the internet is a big fuzzy cloud uh, which sends asynchronous small packets unreliably around. And all of your computers have a software stack running TCP which uses those small packets to give you a pseudo-reliable bidirectional byte stream service. And it does a lot of stuff. It retransmits lots of things and it has flow control and congestion control. Lots of that stuff. So, oh, and it has two interfaces. There's the wire interface, or sometimes the wireless interface, on which packets come in and out. And then there's the operating system sockets API that applications can use to deal with this stuff. So, what is it, really? Well, that's a very interesting question. There are standards, the IETF, Internet. Uh, what's it called? International Internet Engineering Task Force, something like that. They introduced these standards, um, some particular RFCs, like the industry standards over the years, they go back quite a long time. And they're prose documents with little pictures of packet diagrams and occasionally a fine architecture sheet. So that's the standard. But the real standard is that the standard of requiring interoperability with the common implementations. You know, if you've got a TCP stack and it works okay when it's talking to BSD and various Microsoft stacks and an NF stack and 27 others, then it's good. Otherwise it's not. Um, so this is an implicit standard that's quite hard to get a handle on. We don't even know what that set of implementations is. And each one of them, if you look at the BSD implementation, uh, it's C code. It's not enormous, but 15,000 lines or so. It's multi-threaded, it's time dependent, it's entangled with the operating system. It's not very much uh, picked out. It's been optimized for the last 30 years for performance. It's fast path code doing various things. And maybe we think this is a good thing. Okay. It's almost <coughs> immutable. You can't change it. You can't change that protocol because there's too much other deployed stuff of other implementations maybe running all the time. This is more or less the most deployed software on the planet, as far as I can tell. So the specs are not precise enough. I've got a point over here just for these guys to change. The specs are not precise enough that you can say whether an implementation satisfies the spec. You just can't. So that is a not very satisfactory state of affairs. So um, my colleagues like Keith and Michael and Tom Ridge said that and some others set out to create a precise abstraction, a reasonable spec. So how do you do that? Well, what we did was start by reverse engineering a draft spec from those RFCs and the textbooks and the code. And then we generated a lot of implementation traces by like instrumenting a test network. And then we check whether the spec admits those traces or not. And when it doesn't, we go back and we fix up the spec. And this is some kind of experimental semantic factor, I think. 
And the main, just to give you a tiny sense of what that spec is like, the main part of it was this host transition system. So this is a model of just a single TCP stack with, as a label transition system between host states uh, with labels which are the sockets API calls and returns and the wire packets going in and out with the internal transitions and time packet transitions. And then we also made uh, a more abstract spec that models this whole thing just with the socket interface events at the endpoints, and that's the service that you get from TCP. And so, what does this kind of thing look like? I'll show you a rule. Oh, I'll show you a rule. One rule. That's a, sort of a typical rule. Lots of things are small. Uh, that's one and a half percent of the spec, so I encourage you not to try to read all the symbols. But I want to tell you something about it. So this rule, uh, it's a transition rule. You've got a host state, and it does an internal step to a new host state, subject to the side condition. <laughs> <laughs> On the side, you see. Um, this is the rule that deals with the host receiving a, a SYN packet and sending a SYN app packet when you're starting a connection. Um, so, all of this stuff is, cons is constraints on fields of the host state, basically. So you introduce a bunch of new variables and you constrain them. So, you can see there is some problem of scale. Right? You have to be able to work with this stuff, which is more on the scale of the typical code that you work with than the nice little rules that you write down in ICFP papers. And that means the tools have to be up to it. You have to be able to, you know, check this stuff and typeset it and add lots of comments so that the readers can understand and all that kind of thing. What language do you need to write down this kind of role? So that's a very interesting question. So this spec has to be <coughs> extremely loose for lots of different reasons. So one thing is that just the implementation part quite properly, vary in quite radical <coughs> ways. So, for example, if you receive a bunch of, of TCP segments from the wire, they might overlap um, in the stream that they are supposed to be put together into. And if, they, if you've got overlapping segments, then you might reassemble those into a single stream in lots of different ways. And any of those ways are allowed. So the spec has to admit that variation. And it has to admit Simple variation, uh, the implementations have to pick new sequence number every now and again. And you have to let them pick any kind of a sequence number. And then there's sort of runtime on the terms. A lot of the behavior is uh, determined by um, timing and other scheduling kinds of things, which you can't see happen from the outside. But you have to admit any of that variation. And if you don't admit it, your spec won't admit when you include the observed traces of the implementation. So this pushes you strongly towards a relational spec, not a functional one. And this is a big thing. This means you, um, you can't use the obvious nice alternative. The obvious nice alternative is to write a reference implementation in maybe a pure functional language and say, make it like this. But here you just can't do that, because you, any, any such implementation would over-resolve the non-deterministic choices that you have to leave loose. That's the main interesting thing there. So you also, it's a fairly complex structured state, so you've got to have uh, interesting types and real numbers and records and finite maps and stuff. And then some of the 15,000 lines of VSD code we found just too complex to disentangle into a nice simple declarative spec. It was, it was too imperative for us. We couldn't cope with that. So we divided, uh, you know, one of the rules is actually a composition of, I think, four different state changes glommed together with some kind of relational one out. Each one for us trained up by Simon very properly years ago. He knows about one uh, And therefore, um, we use that. We need that structure. So that's a fairly higher order structure. 
but you don't need very fancy type. So, with apologies to about half of you, um, we didn't have any need for dependency, which I think you'll see. Uh, with apologies to fewer of, you, fewer of you than there should be, we didn't need any fancy module structure, although we would like to modularize the spec in better works. So, this pushes us to writing it in a higher level logic. In fact, the higher level logic of the whole four three works basically the same as the logic of Isabel Hall, these books. So, that's a spec written in really arbitrary higher order logic. But we want to check whether that actually seems to be the behavior. So what can we do? And well, that's in some sense execute it. But we don't want to run it as a program. We want to run, we want to check the decision from it. So if we're given an experimentally observed trace of those labels, and we're given the spec, we want to decide whether there exists a trace in the spec with those labels, and maybe with internal actions at arbitrary points in between. So that's a tricky computational problem if you're given arbitrary higher order logic. But this is in a nice theorem prover. It's got lots of tactics to do stuff and decision procedures and things. Um, so uh, we can do that automatically in all four by scripting together the tactics and the decision procedures that we have to hand. And there's a handy functional meta language, this, and now, uh, here being used for its original purpose. Uh, <laughs> one of the probably many excellent ideas uh, to do that in a reasonably secure way. So, to be a little bit more concrete about that, so uh, after you execute, uh, so lots of the rules are in non-deterministic, and the simple kind of non-determinism is just that they introduce constraints on values, something numerical like this. So as you observe more data on the trace, you start to be able to resolve these constraints, uh, to narrow them down. So instead of checking the existence of ground transitions over ground host states, we have to do symbolic execution in quite a strong sense of symbolic, because we check, given some assumptions on the host state, there is a transition of blah, and then we add these assumptions as we go along. So the states of this symbolic execution are arbitrary higher order logic formulae. That's the only way to fly. Uh, so this is this combination of the whole four language and this collection of decision procedures and tactics is some kind of a DSL. It's a specification DSL for this problem. Uh, quite an exotic one, but it does the job. Did we get pick up in the network community after we did this. Did all of this work? It's nice to reflect in retrospect every now and again. So some things worked really well. So we did handle, we think, pretty much all the detail of the real protocols. So that DSL was up to the job. Uh, and we wrote a big annotated tech report describing this fact. And we found some bugs. Well, it's nice to find bugs. Um, some of them quite subtle. So if two things try to open connections with each other at once, that's supposed to work, but it doesn't always. Um, if you... Uh, so the code has sort of fast path optimization, the implementation code has fast path optimization, and if you send packets perfectly well formed, go down that fast path for four gigabytes, then a particular feature of the protocol will stop working until you sent another four gigabytes of data, and then it'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not something you can easily detect by normal system detesting, but if you're doing this very careful checking of the concrete state and the state of the model after each transition as you go along, uh, you get to see this kind of thing. And we published some papers, and people said nice things about it. It's very good. But did it really work? Well, sort of-ish. Uh, did we get take up of the tools and the ideas and what have you? So, did you get them to fix the bug? So this is a part of the first point here. We didn't try very hard to get them to fix the bugs. <coughs> we told them about it a bit. Uh, but then, we were very tired, we were needing <laughs> some time. Postdocs that were doing this mostly, we got other things. Suffered a bit of a failure of will. 
ないなら。うん。Um, difficulty with、um, getting taken for this task is that maybe, o n e of the t h i n notwithstanding, we were too clever. So we used this fancy higher order logic and this fancy tactic based decision procedure around evaluation. And if you walk, so the first comment I think I got when I gave a talk at the system conference about this、um, was ah, we understand C code. C code is good. We're not going to read your higher order logic. <laughs> so, in fact, they perfectly well can read your higher order logic if they feel like it. I have tested that. <laughs> But, especially if you annotate it nicely, typeset it, and all that kind of thing.、Uh, but they're certainly not in a position to、um, maintain the theorem prover tactic script、uh, that does the evaluation. And also, we never made, so we had lots of tools to do this bug finding, check braces, but we never engineered those into a really turnkey thing that someone could just you know, plug in there. TCP and we check it. We wanted to do that, but it just would have been another couple of、um, person years of work and we just couldn't. So we were a bit too clever in some sense. I couldn't realistically, I couldn't reasonably walk up to them and say, yes, you should do just what we did.、Um, and there's also a bigger question of whether that community thinks they have a problem with. The imprecision of these specifications. And it's obvious that they don't have a problem because they invented the internet and it's good. <laughs> so, and it's not even supposed to work all that well. <laughs> I mean, it's really not. You know, TCP is supposed to be allowed to go wrong every now and again. So, as long as it doesn't actually give you bad data very often, which Uh, could happen with this reassembly stuff, but tends not to, then you're sort of okay. Yeah. So, in retrospect, it was a bit of a non starter、uh, to get them to have enthusiasm. Now, that's for handling existing protocols. If you talk to you know, some networking post ops and you say, ha, you're trying to implement、uh, what's it, SCTP,、uh, are you having fun? Then some of them will say, no, and, and your work is. They do this before they try it. But they say, Your work should be a godsend to me because you know, I've got this whole book describing this protocol and there's no way that I can possibly get it right.、Mm-hmm. So there is some, some force there, but it's very hard to connect our technique <laughs> to their actual problem. So,、um, more specific lessons for the future. So, for this post hoc specification of this big existing thing, I still can't see any other. Better choice of、uh, specification language and testing environment. But if you were doing this a bit more from scratch, then if you could isolate that non determinism and instrument it so you can see from the outside when the choices are being made and what choices they are, then you could do something much simpler. Then you could just have you know, a purely functional、uh, definition of the allowable behavior from one determinist, non determinist point to the next. And that would be a whole lot easier to work with. And then there's a, a much more general point, which is that these people are writing specifications, but they're not in any way making any attempts to make the specifications testable. There's just no, no way of relating code to spec except by reading one and reading the other. And that's, that's not a good plan. Okay. Let me move on, otherwise, we will be here for much too long.、Uh, to program languages. I've divided them into two buckets. <laughs> <laughs> At least the, one, the ones that I could think of easily in three minutes yesterday evening,、uh, that I could think of that were reasonably widely used.、Uh, on the left hand bucket are some of our favourite languages, which sort of have a Sort of normative, sort of precise definition. <laughs> <laughs> This is not an accurate description of the truth. <laughs> And on the right hand side, some of my favourite languages, which don't. <laughs> I have a, a work 
working with some answers if for many years I find myself a slightly distressing situation and I wonder why and what we can do about it. So I should tell you a little historical tale from, as it were, the last time I was coming to ICFBs. There's some colleagues and I in the um, early 2000s who were thinking about typeface distributed functional programming. We thought that would be a good thing for the world to have. Probably it still would be a good thing for the world to have. I see there's a talk on you know, marshalling and types so late this morning. And we did the usual kind of thing. Yeah? So we invented some lambda calculi. Um, I wrote a couple of ICFP papers and came along, it was all great fun. And uh, with tech reports full of complicated proofs. And then we thought we would try and scale this up into a more substantial language design and invented this acute coverage that had a lot of ideas plugged in. And we uh, thought we'd be very proper, so we wrote a definition of that, um, which was sort of 80, 80 pages of rules and syntax and things, uh, which was invaluable as a design tool. And we wrote sort of an, an interpreter implementation that more or less followed that semantics. That was good. The papers did so much things. Um, and then we thought we would scale that up a bit more and do hack on the OCaml implementation to incorporate some of these features. And this was with Mark Schimmer. This Mark. Mark. Mark somewhere. Um, and some other people. And so we hacked on the implementation and wrote paper and people did reasonably nice things. Um, and okay, so what was wrong with this, this little narrative? Several things went wrong with it. So one thing that went wrong is, well, we wrote these 40-page you know, technical reports full of proofs, and rather late in the day for one of them, Keith Wander got a bit suspicious about whether our system was sound. Mm -hmm. um, we paid attention and we opened the 40-page tech report full of proofs and we looked very carefully, very carefully, and we found a teeny little hole in the proof, this big. At exactly the point necessary to conceal the unsoundness. <laughs> so we saw, and this was a 40 page tech report written by some of our colleagues, <coughs> and a bit us, but mostly by people who were really clever and extremely careful. Mind bogglingly careful. So that gave us a little bit of pause. And then the other thing that went, um, well, a couple of other things went wrong with this. So when we were writing this 18-page <coughs> language definition here, it was invaluable as a design tool, but it was extremely frustrating because we had no support for keeping it sort of internally, even self-consistent, even internally type-checked. And that was quite annoying. And then when we got to this, uh, there we were, hacking away on the OCaml compiler, um, as it were, without a safety net. You know, we didn't, we had to integrate our clever new features with lots of existing things. We didn't exactly know what they were, we didn't exactly know how our features should be integrated, and it was all a little bit, a little bit wibbly. So this was part of the motivation for two things. Um, one was this Popplemark challenge that um, Benjamin Pierce and Stephanie Varick was here, and Steve Stansvik and others and I um, did in uh, um, 2005 or something, to try and see how we could address the first problem of you know, the 40 page tech report that was just not quite true, despite our best efforts. And then the other problem of um, trying to make it much easier to work with full-scale language definitions um, turned into this uh, tool that uh, Francesco D'Arnandelli and Scott Ernest and I built called Hot, which is a domain specific language for writing semantics. Uh, it's very simple. Um, <coughs> You write some syntax and some inductive definitions, and it gives you type checking of those definitions nice and quickly, and some decent type check, decent type setting that you need to put in your papers, and reasonably idiomatic de definitions in the theorem rules that you can then use to prove, and a little bit of boilerplate code in OCaml for sort of walking over the abstract syntax and doing substitutions and that kind of stuff. So just to see. Uh, what it's like, there's uh, an hot source file, and you should be able to understand it without me telling you anything about it. See? Obvious, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, as I say, simply type that in Telescope is not very challenging. Right? The point here is to have enough stuff and a simple enough uh, interaction. 
caching mode, but you can scale this up to the 80 page language definition and it works nicely. And indeed, I think it does. Uh, there's some evidence that it does. So we and other people uh, used it for quite a few different things. Uh, so Stephanie tells me that she's used it for three generations of Haskell Core, FC. Um, it's a good effect. Uh, <laughs> she did say she had to arm twist her authors a little bit in order to get a good effect. But, went off, so the Java, Java was getting a new module system design at the time. One of my students, Roxanne, so went off and talked to them. They had a, you know, a big long draft pro spec, and he read it, and it's all nice important things, and found some design decisions that he thought should be made differently, and, and talked to them, and he proved a lot of things in his development, and lots of stuff. So it's all quite successful, in some sense. So there's a clear conclusion, anecdotally, uh, that if your problem is in its domain, if you're writing down Inductive relations over an elaborate complex, it's great. And the reward effort trade off is great. I'm sure you can, if that's what we're doing. Um, okay, so what about the sort of the production language question then? So for networking, there was a big question of accessibility. And here, there isn't really. All the people that are doing this kind of thing can perfectly well cope with writing down a bit of syntax and some inductive rules, because that's what they do all the time. Do, does the target community think that the prose specs are a problem? This is an interesting question. Because clearly, we mostly do around here believe that we should write definitions of the calculi that we invent with their tricky new concepts. And I think we mostly do think that it would be desirable to have similar such definitions for our whole languages, although some people might not. Um, but somehow it hasn't happened. And maybe it hasn't happened because it's just a bit too much work. Um, so there's certainly something which is true now and wasn't true in 2005, which is that the proof assistants themselves are much more widespread and also a bit better. So it's tempting, maybe maybe even best better idea, to just try directly in the proof system. Although that doesn't give you all of the same things. So maybe we really didn't do enough. In fact, we certainly didn't do enough. So the Type system, the meta language type system that we're using here, um, <coughs> you've got these inductive relations and you've got arbitrary context free grammars, which is more or less um, <coughs> the data types and stuff, but there's no parametric, and there's a little bit of subtyping for these you know, values as a sub grammar of the terms and that kind of thing, but there's no parametric polymorphism at all. And at the end of the day, that's just too annoying to live with. You want to write you know, auxiliary functions that just do simple stuff and have simple things like a conditional in the rules every now and again, which you really need to be um, uh, parametrically polymorphic. And then the other thing we didn't do, so we support generation into the provers, but our focus wasn't really on the testing thing here. Right? So we didn't do um, testing, we didn't provide any direct support for for testing whether your implementations relate to those uh, relation definitions. Yeah. And that's a big limitation. We did a bit because some of the provers can generate actual code from you know, these relation definitions, this is web for example. So you can use that, but it's a bit clunky. Um, so we didn't do this sort of Redex, Redex animation thing. We had a couple of students who tried it, but it didn't really end up with production. So, oh, and then another interesting thing, going back to the <coughs> industrial experience. So, Rock went off and did this stuff on the Java module system, and it sort of worked. Um, and I think he did make, cause some changes in their mainstream design, but it didn't really work. And it didn't really work for this very simple reason it's that the timing just wasn't quite right. right. They had, by the time we got to it, they had already essentially made immutable. I think that should be good. Um, too much of their design. There wasn't the scope to fix it up in more substantial ways. Okay. Part three. Uh, these little vignettes. So, multiprocessors. And I will talk to you about 
x86 and IBM Power or Power PC and ARM processors and C and C++, which I'm told is the language of choice for discriminating hackers. Uh, I can only imagine that it's the language of choice for discriminating hackers because it now has a fine concurrency model, which it never used to. So before 2011, C and C++, maybe slightly shocking to you, despite having been used for concurrent software since God knows when, uh, had no concurrency semantics at all in even the pro standards. But now they do. So, so this is concurrency and it's shared memory concurrency. It's not everything there is. It's not fancy GPU concurrency or fancy cloud concurrency. It's still a reasonably important kind of concurrency. Uh, you do have it in your mobile phones in your pockets, probably, going on at the moment. Um, so you've got lots of threads interacting with a shared memory. Easy. Well, you would like to think you've got lots of threads interacting with a shared memory. And indeed, there is a fine, noble, venerable tradition of papers on concurrency verification uh, which assume that they do. All of them, basically. Uh, you know, this is by me, everything. So, what actually happens in these systems is a bit more complicated. So if we just look at x86 first, instead of that picture, you might reasonably have in your head a picture a little bit more complicated. So the difference here is that each of these threads, now it doesn't write directly into the head memory, it writes into a FIFO buffer, and then eventually those writes dribble out and become visible to the other threads. And when it reads, if there is a write to the same address in the write buffer, it will read the most recent one, and otherwise it will read from the shared memory. And then there's some atomic instructions, compare and swapping things, but lock up the whole machine effectively while we do it. This is not a picture of the hardware, I emphasize. This is a programmer's model. Um, and this is demonstrating a basic fact, which is that the architects of this world are very smart, and they're trying to make your computers go fast, because this is what you want. And it's very slow to wait for these rights to propagate everywhere. So, usually you need it. So we just declare the machine won't give you the illusion that they instantly propagate everywhere as soon as you do. If you need them to, you can add in extra variable instructions and so on. That's 86. X86 and also Spark is like this. It's not too complex. Move to Power and ARM. So Power and ARM are very different architect architectures, but they have similar concurrency models. And they're much more relaxed. Children of the 60s, I suppose. Um, no, it's not. No, no. Um, they're much more relaxed than x86. There's a lot more sort of thread local reordering and speculative execution going on in a programmer visible way. And they don't have the property that you have got here. So even though you have these buffers here, there's a really, really lovely property, which is when a write comes out of the buffer, it instantly becomes visible to all the other threads. And on these machines, that's not the case. You have to think of them sort of as each thread having its own copy of memory, and then the right by that thread propagating on many different paths to the other threads. It's not multi-copy atomic. Now, how are these things specified? I could have a whole talk making fun of how they're specified, but time is short, so I'll just do sort of a meta, a meta making of fun and give you a quote from one of our friendly processor architects who wrote, you know, one of the architect manuals. All that horrible, horribly incomprehensible and confusing text that no one can parse or reason with, not even the people who wrote it. This is assessment of the um, uh, specification of quality. And so that's like these things. Uh, when we started this in 2007, so and I read this x86 book and you just couldn't make sense of it. And it was clear that nobody else could make sense of it either and hadn't been able to for years. You could find you know, long conversations in the Lennox Kernel mailing list where they hadn't been able to make sense of it and they had to go off and ask a guy from Intel. 
Um, for C and C++, so yeah, in a slightly different situation, but a bunch of people, Hanfam and former Kenny and others, had been designing a high-level language model for several years. Um, when we came along, uh, which was mostly Mark Batty, they had a draft standard in prose that was reasonably sensible. And it wasn't completely clear, but it was sort of sensible. But it was... Yeah, it wasn't completely clear in exactly the ways you would expect from a prose specification about something very subtle. I should give you a tiny little program. Um, I thought I would give you four lines of code. Um, so, this is a two-threaded program. This is just to show some of the kinds of observable behavior that you can get. There are lots of other things that you can also get. It's just one, one particular thing. So this is a message pass example. So on thread north, you write some data, and then you write a flag to say that you've done it. You do, my data is good. And on thread one, you wait reading that flag, and then you read the data. And the question is whether that read is obliged to see that proper value, or whether it might read some older value by mistake. Um, if you think of this as pseudocode for an assembly program, then, well, if you were in this sequentially consistent machine, this would work fine. So you would do these writes in order, so they become visible to that thread in the same order, and that would be good. If you're on the x86 machine with these flasho buffers, it's still fine, because you do those writes in order, and they go into your local buffer in order, and the buffer is twice up, so they come out in order and become visible to the other thread in order, and this is fine. If you do this on power and arm, uh, well, here's some data. Let's have some numbers every now and again. Um, various generations of power processors, various generations of arm processors, these are the number of times that you see the zero value here out of some number of executions in a particular test arm that we're running. And you can see it happens. It happens quite often, like one in a hundred times or something. Um, and this is further evidence of the microarchitects being kind to you. It's inefficient to, rock, to push these right out in the same order, even if they're to the same address. Sorry, to different addresses. It's inefficient to, to not start reading that data until after this. You might be able to prefect it, you know, somewhere up here. <laughs> it's inefficient to make all of the interconnect between these hardware threads uh, push writes in the strict order, even if they're to different addresses. So, in fact, if you do those writes in order and you don't speculate that read, these writes still might propagate the other thread out of order. And your computer will go faster and use less power and you'll be happy. Compiler artists are also very clever are kind to you. So now, now suppose you run this program, uh, now think of this as a C program, and suppose you run it just on an SE or a TSO machine, so forget about that hardware you're ordering underneath, and you just run it, you compile it. Well, there's a slightly boring problem, program, so you actually compile it in a bigger uh, context. And maybe the context has another read of data up here. Ah. Other writers, they're very smart. Um, they've got that sitting around in a register. Why would they bother to read it again down here? That would be stupid. Your program would go slower, use more power. Um, so, yeah, so, this will also, even on an SC machine, often read zero. So, this just gives you some kind of a clue um, of the kind of effect that you can get. Um, if you want this not to happen, in this, in particular, in this new C and C++ 11 model, then you can do various things. But one of the things you can do is annotate these reads, sorry, these writes and these reads, uh, with special magic things. And those special magic things will make the compiler not do so much reordering. And also, on the hardware uh, architectures that aren't strong enough by themselves, will insert some memory barriers or fences or dependencies or what have you. So if we just see this for a second, see if this works. Live demo is always fun. So 
So here is that same example in um, a slight extension of C++11 with a top level parallel composition instead of three iterations, just make examples smaller. And you can see we've got the two writes, and this one is labeled memory order release, and the two reads, and this one is labeled memory order acquire. And if we run that program in the semantics, the semantics tells us that we have four candidate executions, and one of those is a consistent one, whatever that means, and it's a race-free execution too. So that's good, that means this is a good program. Um, and this is a picture of that execution. It's a picture of the good execution. But it's actually more interesting to see a picture of the bad execution that you can't understand why it's forbidden. So, uh, let me see here. So that's that. So you can see this is a bad execution. This is the two writes and the two reads, and we're reading from the initial state instead of reading from this write of x to 1, but we wanted to read from it. So why is that forbidden? look up here and we can see that it's violated the <coughs> consistent non-atomic read values property. I'm not going to tell you exactly what that is, but I'm just going to turn on the visibility of the happens to four relation of that model, which is now these green arrows, and that's calculated from the others in a way that I'm not going to tell you. Um, but you can see that now this right that we read from if we look back along the happens before chain for other writes to the same address, it's hidden by this one. And that's a bad thing, which that predicate that I'm not going to show you rules out. And that's why this is not a consistent text function, and part of the reason why we do get just the behavior we wanted. Okay, so time is quickly ticking on. So again here, we have to create some precise abstractions these things. We're not in the business just of formalizing some existing spec. Um, for the hardware, we have to create abstractions, especially for power and arm, sort of out of whole cloth. For the C and C++, uh, we have to take their draft design, which is sort of semi a bit mathematical, but reasonably sensible, and make it precise and good and fix various faults in it and so on. And they are, uh, as I hope I've persuaded you just with these examples, quite subtle specs, and they're also quite loose. They have to admit all of this different wild behavior. And they're sort of on a modest scale. So that CA11 concurrency model is about a thousand lines of specification, about a 25th of the um, GCP spec. And this is including all our comments and stuff. Um, but it's a bit beyond comfortable pencil and paper and whiteboard map. If you've got those definitions and you're trying to look at one of those examples on a whiteboard, very painful. If you think about what language we need to write this spec, it's quite interesting because uh, there's no object syntax to speak of in you know, assembly code. It's okay, but there's no entertaining inductive structure. Uh, there's no variable binding or anything like that. Um, there's no need for very fancy types, scarcely even higher order. They might not be higher order, in fact, I can't remember. Um, so what you're basically doing is writing down programming in discrete map with sets and relations and records and that kind of thing. So what we invented for ourselves was a nice little language um, just of definitions of types and functions and inductive relations with and quantifiers and set comprehensions and top level polymorphism and that kind of thing. So this is roughly the intersection of the definition languages of those three proofs. It's deliberately unambitious, type-wise. Type, type um, and then it gives you some of the same kinds of things that we had before, with type text definitions in a good way. It's engineered like a programming language. Stuff just works instead of having to swear at the prover. It's just um, gives you reasonably decent typesetting. It spits out, so it works, it encodes those into the prover definitions in a very conservative way. So it works around some of the awkwardnesses, um, but it preserves all the white space and the comments and that kind of thing wherever it can. So you can read those uh, resulting <coughs> definitions and work with them. 
And then you get uh, a CAL code, at least for the functional part, not at the moment in calculations, we didn't need that yet, um, that you can run. And uh, when I'm showing you this example here, this is using a lovely tool chain, taking the LEM mathematical definitions um, and compiling them with LEM to OCaml, and then compiling from that OCaml with JS yeah, OCaml to JavaScript, and then running them in the browser. It's not a super high assurance compilation story. It's so handy, uh, and much better than anything else that we've recently do. Let's just see some of that code very quickly. Um, type definitions, definitions of functions, quantifiers, set comprehensions. It's just very straightforward and just works. That's the idea. Now, executing the specs. So before we had this complicated decision problem of checking a trace. And here we have a different problem. So given a candidate program, we do want to calculate the set of all the executions that the model permits, so that we can compare that with what the hardware does or what we want the language to do. And we want to do that in a stupid way, in order to maintain some assurance. Though, depending on what model, a different kind of stupid way. And then we also, and then it's time to talk about it, we need to generate lots of good tests for the hardware. So, uh, did that work? Sort of, yeah. We do, I think, handle the real behavior, at least within the scope that we aim for. I found some bugs. I recommend, if you're going after finding bugs, it's more fun to find bugs in chipping hardware. <laughs> pay more attention. It's also very fun to have other people find bugs in not yet chipping hardware using your testing tools. That's quite fun too. Um, we published some papers and people said nice things. But um, then well, there's actually some sort of semantic effect on industrial languages going on here. So uh, Mark went along to this C standards committee and explained to them uh, that actually their definitions were a bit broken and fixed it up. And now that ISO standard and our mathematical model are really in a, a very tight correspondence with each other. So that's nice. And we fixed and verified the scheme for compiling, not whole compiler, but compiling the concurrency primitives from that C model down to our and R, power really, arm sort of. And that's quite handy because all the compilers have to agree on this if you're going to get code that works when you link it together. This is part of the ODI. This is in some sense a directly industrially relevant theorem, which we have some on ground, but maybe not as many as would be nice. And then maybe the most significantly is that we clarify the architectural intent for these jobs with ongoing chats with the architect. So it's quite uh, surprising and shocking that you can walk up to the, uh, an architect of a major line of processors and say, here is a 10 assembly, a 10 assembly instruction program. Does your architecture permit this behavior? <coughs> and they can say, I don't know. Because <laughs> it's, and they know the particular hardware of the particular implementations they design usually very well, but what this architectural abstraction is, is a much harder thing to get a handle on, uh, especially if you don't have any way of writing it down. So, um, I've talked about three domain-specific specification languages. Quite different, uh, some quite exotic, some a little bit exotic, some very plain and straightforward. Um, and you see some recurring themes, uh, which uh, hopefully I can make some coherent whole of in about 30 seconds. Um, so, Dealing with ill-defined and loose specifications. So dealing with ill-defined specifications here was a lot of the, the sort of real intellectual work. So going and saying, what should this architectural abstraction be? And engaging with the, you know, the hardware issues and the software issues and the specification issues all at the same time. That was the real work. So the fact that the specifications in all these cases had to be very loose is a, sort of a technical determiner of what kind of technique you can use. So if that's not the case, 
if you're living in a nice deterministic world, then you can just get away with a reference implementation in some widely accessible language, um, a pure function one, and that would be good. Right? And you could use that for testing against the rest. But the specification has to be loose, it has to be much more interesting thinking. Uh, testing against the semantics was absolutely vital in the first case and the last case, and should, would be vital in the second case, if only we'd actually done more of it. Uh, there we did proofs, not testing. Proofs are good too, but um, we can't use proofs to relate to normal software development. Right? Software is developed by running it and seeing if it works. And it's even really developed by running it on the hardware that we have to hand, not on the architectural abstractions, and seeing if it works. So without some tools for relating semantics to code, we're not in the game. Dealing with scale, so I didn't talk about well, a lot of small engineering things in these languages to make them usable at a big scale. All of that is completely like So OP is full of entertaining little ad hoc tweaks that we made to let us actually use it. Um, LEM is a bit more sort of coherent, but still designed very much with that in mind. They are DSLs for specification, not for programming. Although we are, as we see, at these scales, specification and programming are maybe somewhat merged together. Interaction with systems, community, and take up. So this depends on so many things. Um, the, I mean, first you have to actually do something worth doing, obviously. I think we did that, maybe not. Uh, then it also, you have to be able to. Um, Either persuade or find the audience which, already, which thinks they have a problem. Otherwise, it's just a non starter. And you have to be sufficiently accessible to that audience. So, in this hardware thing, in some sense, we have to be very, very humble in the face of engineering reality as our colleagues perceive it. We are not really knowledgeable, uh, I, so I don't think I have any reason to have an opinion broadly on what the processes should do. And they, they're juggling so many different hardware trade-offs that are not accessible to us, that I just can't do that. I have an opinion on how we should describe it, and sometimes I have very little opinions on what it should do. Um, but we have to be sort of humble in the face of that. And we also have to be very um, careful in how we approach them. So Mark and I, when we went to the CE standards committee, we accidentally showed them a quantifier. <laughs> now, I really mean accidentally, you know, we were showing this lot of slides and sort of flipped across and, oh, there's a quantifier. And that was a bad thing. <laughs> and we had to sort of calm down. <laughs> and we were accused of perpetrating Greek letters that one. Um, <laughs> it's not, so it's a very smart guy. Right? It's just that this is not their language. And it's very much the case that we have to go to them and speak much as we can in their language, and in the best of possible worlds, we might find someone, so we have found one of my colleagues is a, um, an architect who did go to logic courses when he was young, and even though he doesn't actually read the rules that we write, uh, he can perfectly well read the English translations of the rules, and we can argue about those point by point with him. Um, but we have to be very careful about what interface we use there. So there is no, no super grand conclusion to this talk, and there's not really time for it anyway, but um, I think what I really want to say is, for those of you that haven't come out into that uh, angry wilderness, uh, I commend you to do so, because uh, it's fun and fascinating and entertaining, and if we do a bit more of it, then after a few years, we maybe have an elegant garden for pieces, mostly sitting together, uh, and then we can go off and do something else, and there will be some kind of a legacy of <laughs> <laughs> some pieces of the infrastructure reasonably well founded. Uh, so, uh, I clearly have to thank uh, all my co-authors for all of these things, and some of these things are where I'm not co-authors, and they are just the authors, uh, for um, doing all of the stuff that I've talked about rather casually here. Uh, it's really all up to them, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>